surveillance, surveillance self-defense. Um, he previously worked at Mozilla as a paranoia advocate and was a coordinator for the TOR project. Um, and he studied computer science and technology policy at Princeton. Um, so today, uh, you'll be hearing from Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, as Kristen said, I'm Tom Lowenthal, and I'm here to talk to you about journalists. Uh, before I begin, this is just for the camera, you don't need to listen. Uh, know that this talk is available under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike license. The presentation is a performance of a written script, and audio and video recordings are also subject to that license. I, I really like talking to a room this size because it's just big enough for me to be able to ask folks uh, what they're all about and know who's in the room without having to put anyone on the spot. So sorry folks on the live stream, I'm going to try and tailor what I'm saying to the people who are actually in the room today. Uh, I want to do a quick uh, couple of shows of hands. No need to raise your hand if you don't want to, I just want to get an impression of who's here. Uh, so hands for undergraduate students grad students, staff, faculty, other, okay. Uh, affiliated with uh, the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, uh, with the iSchool in general, with Berkeley as a whole, okay. Um, and then folks who work in a generally technical area on technical topics, folks who work on policy, and folks who work on journalism or are journalists. Brilliant, okay. Um, so I've asked a little about you. Let me tell you a little more about me um, and why there's any reason for you to listen to what I have to say. Uh, I've worked as the staff technologist at the Committee to Protect Journalists for three years. At CPJ, my job is to be a technical generalist, to make sure that we get things right when it comes to tech. And not just in the technical details, although that is certainly important, uh, but also to make sure that we navigate tech policy in such a way as to select positions uh, that build towards our ultimate vision for a free and open society in which journalism is easy to practice without fear of censorship or of reprisal. Uh, before CPJ, I worked at the Tor Project, who develop and maintain an online anonymity system uh, and associated anonymous web browser. Uh, on Mozilla's privacy and public policy team, I work to ensure that Mozilla lived up to our stated values of putting people first and respecting everyone's privacy, as well as uh, pushing in larger public policy debates uh, for a free and open internet. Uh, at Princeton, I studied at the Center for Information Technology Policy. I was looking at questions of how technology influences society and how society can get the most out of technology without being purely driven by it. My thesis was about copyright, uh, the impact of our incredibly long copyright terms and what a more socially responsible copyright model would look like. Uh, so let me tell you about CPJ a little bit uh, to set up the, uh, the premise that I'm about to get into. Uh, CPJ has a very descriptive name. Our job is to protect journalists, all of them, everywhere in the world, whether they're uh, professionals, whether they work for a new news agency, uh, whether they're freelancers, whether they're uh, volunteer, don't get paid, uh, simply practice journalism a little bit on the side. Um, we protect journalists and like a committee, we're swift and nimble at making decisions. Uh, we're a watchdog. We track press freedom violations all around the world. We keep track of every single journalist who is kidnapped, arrested, uh, detained, assaulted, attacked, beaten, raped, or murdered. Every year we publish a comprehensive list of every journalist who is imprisoned at the end of the year, uh, every journalist who has been imprisoned over the course of the year, everyone who's been uh, murdered, uh, or killed in retaliation for their work in journalism. Um, our blog is not upbeat. Um, we also provide uh, emergency response support for journalists at risk. Our emergency response team uh, provides uh, comprehensive life-saving assistance to journalists and media support staff working around the world. 
We publish targeted safety advisories uh, when we have new information uh, that we think will assist journalists and their support staff in the we coordinate certain classes of regional emergencies, especially responses to kidnappings. And we provide direct assistance, often financial assistance, to journalists when they need help paying for things like med medical or legal expenses. I'm very proud of the work that we do to protect and assist journalists. I work with a team of driven, smart, talented people who work incredibly hard to uh, protect journalists through the difficult work of advocacy and reporting. But advocacy and reporting can only go so far. When a journalist is kidnapped by Daesh, there is really not much that we can do to intervene. When a journalist is beaten in retaliation for their reporting, we can certainly help them out with their immediate medical bills, but we can't erase that trauma. When a journalist is murdered, there is nothing that we can do to bring them back. My real goal is to stop journalists from getting kidnapped, arrested, detained, assaulted, attacked, beaten, raped, or murdered in the first place. That's the focus of my team at CPJ, our safety and emergencies group. Uh, some journalists face physical risks to their safety. Uh, that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. All journalists face technical threats. And my focus on uh, CPJ's emergency response team is on those technical threats. Computer security is about as critical for journalists as it is for anyone. Journalists face an elevated risk of technical attacks. Journalists are often visible figures. They frequently have unpopular opinions and can anger uh, or irritate a lot of people very quickly. Uh, visibility and dislike are key drivers of amateur technical attacks, attacks by people who aren't paid to attack. They just want to teach someone a lesson for saying the wrong thing. Uh, audience. The size of an audience, its composition, and the content of a message drive professional targeting by intelligence agencies and other nation state sort of actors. Journalists often fit in both camps at once, uh, painting a really big target on their back for technical attacks. When we talk about journalist secu uh, computer security in general, we discuss journalists, but not always in the right way. Journalists are a common offhand example of a high-risk user group, but rarely considered a driver of the fundamental design of systems, uh, and do not often come up in the right way in policy debates. Uh, and I think these are oversights. In the design of user-facing computer systems, we're constantly faced with pressures to subtly or not so subtly degrade the security and reliability of those systems, to add so-called lawful intercept surveillance <coughs> capabilities, or to balance the need for immediate security updates with deployability limits, to sometimes even acknowledge the inevitability and reasonableness of governments identifying vulnerabilities, but then also keeping them secret in case they decide that they want to hack someone later. These conversations tend to be framed in terms of maximizing security at the expense of privacy or some other secondary right. Uh, but surveillance does not increase security. A system designed to facilitate or allowed to facilitate surveillance of any kind can never be as safe as one designed to resist it. This is not a security versus privacy debate. It is a security versus security problem, and security should win. Uh, but limited and retrospective perspectives on security and the priorities and experiences of people in law enforcement and surveillance has left the broader computer security world on the defensive against often incomprehensibly fact-free arguments about what security means beyond purely technical disciplines. It is possible to make a computer system that is safe for journalists to use. And it's possible to make a computer system which purports to allow you to catch terrorists or criminals. It is not possible to make a computer system that is both. And if we value a free society, it is an easy choice as to which priority is more important. It's crucial to be clear and unwavering on that point, and I can't emphasize it strongly enough. There is no ostensible security benefit that outweighs the actual security benefit of actually secure computers. Uh, but it gets worse than that. 
uh, because degrading the integrity of computer systems uh, doesn't just extend to lawful surveillance. There's also broad uh, lawful access. There's also broad surveillance. Lawful access systems are just impossible to make safely. If you build a back door, there's no way to control who's going to find it and who's going to use it later. We find it difficult enough to make computer systems that are reliably secure in the first place, let alone protecting an even more complicated computer system with an inbuilt vulnerability. Surveillance writ large is a different story, and it's a, uh, a Faustian bargain. Surveillance agencies have a dream that they could collect enough data and build the right algorithms, and one day they would create a computer system capable of watching everyone and working out who was a terrorist before they commit terrorism. That is impossible. It's not just impractical. It's not just difficult. It is impossible, because the math does not work. Terrorists are not common enough or distinctive enough to be able to identify statistically. Any statistical model that you construct to, with a goal of identifying terrorists will identify people who are not terrorists, but whose behaviors are simply similar to those of terrorists, not because of any actual guilt, but because of limitations in the ability to construct a model. And moreover, because there are roughly zero terrorists, they represent a vanishingly small fraction of all people. Any system designed to identify terrorists based on their observable characteristics will mostly identify people who are not terrorists. It is a statistical problem that cannot be circumvented. The only way to build a computer system that can reliably identify terrorists is to make so many more terrorists that your statistical model will mostly identify them. And I think that that's putting the cart before the horse. So, while we have the debate about ridiculous uh, backdoors into encrypted technology, we also have the more pressing and insidious debate about surveillance capabilities. Because most of your activity records, uh, not the contents of your communication, but behavioral descriptions, what you did, which site you visited, who you're communicating with, are not encrypted and are unlikely to be encrypted anytime soon. And access to those records in a broad way is and can be just as damaging to your privacy and to your well-being as uh, the contents of your communications. But the safeguards are not technically present, in many cases are not legally present, and the argument as to why they should be collected in the first place is flat out wrong in the math. Um, so here's how I want to bring journalists into this. Try to imagine the 20th century. If you're anywhere near as young as me, this will mostly be imagination, not memory. Uh, so once upon a time, it was very difficult to be a journalist. If you wanted to publish a newspaper, you needed to have a printing press. Video news requires bulky cameras, microphones, tape. Broadcasting requires fixed equipment and technical professionals. To operate any sort of endeavor like this, you need to be a business with financial backing. You need to be making money, having cash flow, paying your staff every month on the month. So you could tell who's a journalist. If someone's employed by an organization like that, if they had a printing press or a radio station or a TV channel at their disposal to publish what they produce, those people are journalists. And everyone else wasn't. Uh, no one else could be, even if you wanted to. Uh, even if you were to go out and research a story and write it and edit it, it would be impractical to disseminate it. Journalism was essentially limited to professionals. And no one who wasn't a professional had the capability to participate. But things changed. Uh, we have built a lot of tools that make it much easier to receive and impart information. Uh, probably everyone in this room has with them a camera, which is in every conceivable technical respect superior to the ones that filmed Kennedy and Reagan. You can instantly share text and videos, recordings, documents, databases, basically any form of information you can imagine far and wide with basically anyone in the world. The idea of a journalist as a distinct identity means a lot less than it did 50 years ago. It's a 20th century word for a 20th century wo way of thinking about people and thinking about societies. It's better to talk about acts of journalism and the people who undertake those acts. And when all sorts of people are performing all sorts of acts of journalism, the idea of protecting journalists necessarily transforms into the ideal of making it safe to conduct journalism. 
protecting journalists has to stop being just about getting reporters out of prison or paying for their medical bills after they're beating up or ensuring that their murderers face justice. Instead, we need to protect the practice so that it's safe to perform, so that people aren't afraid about what will happen to them if they practice journalism or participate in its practice. But when journalism is dangerous, we'll see less of it and everyone is worse off in that case. I want everyone to be able to trust their computers, and I hope you do too. I want everyone to be able to talk privately and be sure that their conversations stay private. I don't want anyone to have to worry that the people they choose to talk with will lead to security services knocking at their door or to them being whisked off and tortured. But these things happen every day. They happen to journalists, they happen to political dissidents, they happen to LGBTQ people, and those who suffer from intimate partner violence, and sometimes just to people who are unlucky. A while ago, when I worked at Mozilla, a lot of my work was about inspiring people to help develop the secure, accessible, transparent systems which are worthy of our trust. Sometimes that only takes a nudge if the person you're talking to is already invested in the principle of privacy and individual self-determination. But some folks don't want to be inspired to build a beautiful, shining future where computers are trustworthy, safe, and reliable because they are afraid. Now, those fears aren't always rational. People worry that secure computers mean handing a free pass to a terrorist wizard with a nuke who might be lurking out there in the shadows. And it doesn't matter that there's no such thing as wizards, and it doesn't matter that if wizards existed, they probably wouldn't need nukes, and it doesn't matter that terrorists already have incredibly good ways to communicate secretly and privately without any mathematical assistance from Rives, Shamir, and Alderman. And not only are those conversations exhausting, but they distract from the important work of actually building that bright future that awaits us on the off-world colonies. It's possible to bypass those tedious terrorist wizard with a nuke conversations if you start out talking about journalists. Because you can say that journalists need to be able to talk privately instead of just invoking everyone's fundamental human right to receive and impart information. Journalists need secure computers. Journalists need to be able to protect the anonymity of their sources. Journalists need to be confident that their computers aren't spying on them, covertly recording their conversations or discreetly telling their local dictator what they're doing. And I don't think that anyone's computer should be knocking them out. But when you start out talking about journalists in particular, the idea of a terrorist wizard with a nuke doesn't come up as often, and you can move to the solutions part of the conversation a lot quicker. But it, it gets better because let's say someone is still afraid. They're worried about terrorism, they're worried about organized crime, but they want to help out with journalists because they believe in the fundamental principle of a free press, of a free society, and so forth. Even if the threat they're imagining was real, which in many cases is, it is not, but in some cases it is, what would be necessary to make journalism safe even under those circumstances? Well. We don't know who's going to be performing acts of journalism tomorrow. We don't know who their sources are. We don't know what they're going to be reporting on, or where, or why. So we can't make tools that are only safe when they're used for journalism, but not safe when they're used for nefarious purposes. The only way to make journalism safe overall is to make the internet and cell phones and thermostats and robot vacuums and every other technical tool out there safe for everyone all the time. So if you want to protect journalism in the 21st century and beyond, the only sensible strategy is to build that techno utopia I was talking about previously. Fear is very distracting and humans are very good at thinking about the worst case scenario. We're very good at obsessing over unlikely outcomes. And people who live in the United States, in Western Europe, are constantly told about things to be afraid of. We're bombarded with images of terrible events. We're told almost mythological stories about almost imaginary dangers. It is very easy to be afraid in our society. And if you're afraid, it's easy to dwell on downsides rather than look at upsides. But 
journalism engages the the idealistic part of people's brains. Journalism as a principle, as an ideal, is a positive social value. It allows you to disengage from the fear and try to imagine a positive, productive society and imagine how you're going to get there. So in developing strategies, in promulgating policy, in talking about how to protect privacy and security, talk about journalism. Key into people's idealism to allow them to avoid fear. Paint a portrait of the bright future and let them follow you there. The infrastructure that we build today is infrastructure that we'll be stuck with for decades to come. We built internet, uh, internet protocols a long time ago. We thought they were temporary. They're not. We're still using the email protocols that we developed at the very dawn of the internet. And they're garbage. But we're never going to replace them. Every new protocol, every new technology, every new system and structure and design that we build now are going to be the building blocks of our society for a long time. So we should try to build the best of all possible worlds. And when you're trying to build the best of all possible worlds, you should talk about the best of all possible worlds. Imagine the best of all possible applications. And this isn't just a rhetorical trick to convince people. This, this isn't just using journalism and journalists as a tool to, uh, to change the scope of the argument. This is about actually changing the way you think about how we develop and maintain computer systems and how we build the society that we want to live in. When we're designing for safety, think about users as journalists. Journalists are mostly human. They have many of the same needs as everyone else. Usable security can make all the difference for a journalist, just like it can for anyone else. Journalists don't want to use a computer system. They want to do their job. It just happens that using a computer system is what you need to do pretty much any job. The failure modes of the tools that we develop are going to be the failure modes for everyone, including those most at risk who have the greatest consequences for failure. Many categories of at-risk users are difficult to discuss. They are stressful. They are about thinking about negative consequences and negative situations. Journalists have many of the same risks, not always identical, but mostly similar. And yet you can talk about journalists while thinking about the positives and focus on how to build the place that you want to reach. So think about journalists, design for journalists, talk about journalists, and try to make the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for some questions. So you talked sort of focused a lot on what would the government do to target citizens or journalists if they don't want them, you know, almost to a nefarious extent, sort of eliminating journalists on you know, physical sort of but I wonder, you know, uh, there might be two ways that government goes after sort of journalism within a life. They could kill the journalist, kill the journalist, do something. Or they could sort of make the journalist irrelevant, right? So you have all this fake news or sort of other news sources coming out that sort of just overwhelm what you might consider legitimate journalism or not. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts on whether you or your colleagues are sort of working on this problem of is journalism still relevant? Or how do we keep journalism or legitimate journalism relevant? And why do you think that's something that where the biggest impact will come from journalists themselves, or if that's something sort of making journalism relevant, is something that you need outside organizations, outside disciplines to sort of help you with funding? Well, uh, to answer the, the middle part of your question, journalism is still relevant. I hope never to live in a society where journalism is not relevant. Uh, that sounds like a terrible place, and I don't want to be there. Um, there are a lot of problems in journalism, and some of the, the things you brought up allude to them. Um, the difficulty of uh, economically viable journalism, the uh, challenge of public trust in journalism, especially uh, when there's it, the same tools that make it easy to practice journalism make it easy to spread propaganda. Those are all real problems, uh, but I'm, I'm focused first 
on problems that lead to journalists getting arrested and murdered. And as long as that still happens, and it does, um, I will leave the other problems to other people. They're not less important. There's just room for lots of people to work on different aspects of this problem. Thank you. So you mentioned that there's a need to construct the best possible tools and applications now so that when we're using them in the future, we have a stable foundation, potentially. Um, what possibilities do you see with blockchain technology to achieve this goal? I don't like to talk about blockchain technology. Uh, I think that it's great to have new payment and clearing systems. I don't know what they're going to do or what they're going to be used for. Uh, we built the internet as a communications technology to survive nuclear war. That's not what it is right now. We're building blockchains as a communications technology to allow decentralized payments. Who knows what they're going to be doing in 30 years. Uh, I, uh, I would love to be able to predict the future that reliably, but um, History has suggested that no one can. You said that terrorists have ways of communicating that doesn't require robust engineering. What, what is it that they're doing? Ah, this is a this is a great question. I love this one. Uh, they are meeting in coffee shops and talking to each other. <laughs> they are writing words on pieces of paper, putting them in their pocket, and handing them to other people. Sometimes there's someone who specializes in going between the people. Sometimes there are a lot of them. Uh, organized terrorists, the sort of terrorists who are capable of perpetrating substantial, significant acts of terror, and I'm not referring to uh, the most common terrorists, that is uh, someone who goes out and buys an assault weapon and shoots up uh, a lot of the, the people they know. That's, that's not somewhere where surveillance would even be possible to prevent. Uh, you just need to control the supply of weapons. I mean, organized terrorist groups like uh, ISIL or Al-Qaeda, um, they are strongly invested in building organizational structures that allow them to evade surveillance. And they do so because uh, all of their friends who have ever had cell phones got blown up by drones. So they worked out that cell phones were a really bad plan, and only the terrorists with the discipline not to use cell phones are left out there. So through effective uh, mass surveillance, we have um, created a, a super breed of very rare, very intense terrorists uh, who don't use cell phones, don't use communication technology, but do meet up uh, in family groups and friend groups in person, pass messages on pieces of paper. Basically, they know that they're fighting people from the future, and they can evade them by using 19th century technology. Um, so you mentioned PGP, and I just want to go right in there first. Um, PGP is not a very useful communication technology because it is very difficult to use, uh, and that makes it impractical for actually communicating. If you'd like to send people messages composed of text, maybe pictures, attachments, and so forth, you should use Signal. Or WhatsApp's fine, too. Um, if you are a nerd who wants to refresh the SSH keys for your that's fine. PGP is totally applicable to you. If you want to verify the integrity of software packages manually, PGP, go all the way. But if you are trying to do any other job, PGP is almost certainly not the right tool for you. Uh, as to what is important, uh, here are some things that are important. Turn on the full disk encryption features on your devices. It looks like you're using Apple devices, so your cell phone already has full disk encryption turned on by default. Nice work. Uh, use a PIN code of 11 digits or more, and you are safe till the end of the universe. Uh, for your laptop, uh, the full disk encryption feature, I think I only see Apple computers in this room. So everyone paying attention here, File Vault 2. Uh, you have to turn it on in settings, but uh, it's no more work than that. Uh, every device that you use pretty much has a full disk encryption feature that you should turn on. Uh, you should use um, long, complicated passwords for the passwords that you have to remember. And you only need to remember like four passwords in your entire life. Uh, and l let me go through them. You need to remember the pin code for your phone. That's really important. But you don't need to type it in all the time. You can probably use the biometric unlock feature on your phone. That's fine. Uh, you need to remember the unlock password 
for your computer, and that should be a long random password. So pick eight or more random dictionary words. Uh, you can start to memorize that password pretty easily. You write the words down on a piece of paper, and you store that piece of paper where you keep other important pieces of paper you want to keep safe, like ones with pictures of dead presidents on them. And every time you unlock your computer for a while, you type in those eight words. But it's a hassle to get a piece of paper out of your wallet every time. So you're going to start trying to memorize that password as you're typing it in. And for most people, it takes between one and four weeks of typing in a password every day or multiple times a day before they've memorized it. And once you have, you can take that piece of paper and put it with other important piece of the paper that you don't carry around with you. So like your vast stacks of cash at home or your passport, birth certificate, you know, keep it there just in case you fall and hit your head and can't remember. Um, the third, and this is the segue into my next safety topic, uh, important password to remember is the password for your password manager. Um, so you obviously have to remember that one because you can't type it in using your password manager. But every other password, pretty much every other password, um, there is no reason to store in your head. Uh, passwords are a terrible system because we've created an authentication paradigm based on something that computers are really good at, guessing lots of random things, and humans are really bad at, remembering long random things. Uh, so use a password manager and gradually move over all your passwords for everything that you log into using your web browser or that you have on your cell phone. Uh, move them over to your password manager. Uh, that allows you to stop using just one password for a lot of sites or even to have memorable passwords overall. Um, generate the longest random password that your password manager will generate for you. Uh, use those. Uh, it is actually safer not to have your password in your head for anything that you can type in with a web browser because it protects you against the most common technical attack in the world, phishing. Phishing is the number one attack. Governments use phishing. Hackers use phishing. People who don't like you use phishing. Why does everyone use phishing? Because it is incredibly inexpensive. It expends almost no difficult to obtain resources. You don't need to expend limited scope vulnerabilities. You don't need to spend a lot of money. And it works most of the time. And if there's someone on whom phishing doesn't work, then there's someone can use whatever complicated attack. But phishing comes first. And here's how password managers protect you from phishing. If you are at paypal.com, your password manager will autofill your username and password. And then you can just click log in. Maybe it'll click, click log in for you. If you are at paypa, a letter from another Unicode language that looks a lot like an L, dot com, your password manager won't fill in your username and password, even though you obviously would have typed in your username and password, because who can tell the difference between those characters? The answer is no one. Only robots can tell the difference. Your password manager won't autofill it. And you'll think, wait, something's wrong. Why isn't my password manager autofilling? Why isn't it showing me the sites? And then maybe you'll retype the, the URL, or maybe you'll, you'll investigate, see that something else is wrong. That moment of something is not working usually is one of the most effective things for preventing you from getting phished. So using a password manager that will autofill your username and password will protect you from phishing because it won't quite work on sites that aren't quite right. Another thing that will help protect you from phishing is two-factor authentication. You should use two-factor authentication on every everything that allows it. Uh, even the worst two-factor authentication is better than no two-factor authentication. Even the things that are really just another first-factor authentication that pretends to be two-factor authentication is better than no two-factor authentication. So um, just a little hierarchy of two-factor authentication. The most garbage form of two-factor authentication, which is not actually two factors, uh, it's just pas partial secret disclosure, is the uh, two factors that's probably used by your bank uh, and maybe by your airline, where they ask you a number of secret questions that only you know the answers to. Now that you use a password manager, it is very easy to lie on the answers to those questions. Either pick randomly from the dropdown or create a random uh, series of letters and numbers to fill in there. That will help you to, again, avoid phishing. Um, and also mean that someone who learns true facts about you can't bypass your security using um, true facts in answers to those questions. It's not really two-factor, but you should turn it on if it's there because it's better than not having it. Uh, the next, the, the lowest rung of actual two-factor security is uh, sending you a text message code. Um, it's not the best because it doesn't work when your cell phone's out of batteries or uh, when you don't have connectivity or um, when the person who's out to get you is trying to intercept the connections between the uh, 
system you're trying to log into in your cell phone. You can make it a little bit safer by using a not an actual cell phone number uh, for that. Uh, so uh, a Google Voice number, any other cell phone um, shim service that you use, because then the text message won't actually be sent as a text message to your phone, which is one of the most vulnerable parts of that system. Um, the next best two-factor authentication system is a code generator app on your phone. Uh, you scan a QR code and then it generates a code uh, on your phone every 10 seconds or so and syncs with the server. Uh, that's great because it doesn't require you to be online. Once you set that up, it's, it's good to go. Uh, it'll work on your phone. The best form of two-factor authentication is a security key. Uh, these are little devices. They look like a USB thumb drive. You can't store data on them. Um, they typically have one button on the outside. You plug them in um, and they work with a couple of accounts, but not that many. Uh, more sites are adding support, uh, but uh, that's definitely the best method because it is not possible to fish that factor of authentication. It is possible to type a text message or the code generated from your, your two-factor app into a fake web page. It is not possible for um, security key-based authentication to be fished because the site cryptographically identifies the security key and the security key cryptographically identifies the site. And there's no way around that. Uh, there's no way to intermediate that. So uh, turn on two-factor authentication. That's really important. Um, everywhere that's available. Use the best available form of two-factor authentication. Try to turn off the worst forms of two-factor authentication if the site will let you, but even if it won't, default to using the safer factors of authentication, uh, because then if a site tries to make you use a less good one, you'll be like, wait, something's wrong. Is this phishing? And again, that's the best way to not get phished. Um, automatically install security updates for every piece of software you have, your operating system, your, your cell phone, Try to set it so that you don't have to be involved. Not all devices will let you set it so that you don't have to be involved, but do it as soon as you get a notification about it. Um, and um, those, those are the basics. Um, if you're worried about who is listening to you, who is following you, who is trying to access your information, the bad news is that you don't know who it is until after you have a problem. Um, today, you didn't write anything that pissed anyone off. Tomorrow, you didn't write anything that pissed everyone off. Three months from now, you wrote something that pissed off a bunch of Nazis, and they want to kill you. Now, you didn't know you were going to do that today when you set up this system and you decided how you were going to email the source that you were going to eventually going to ask about something for that article that pissed off a bunch of Nazis. You didn't think about that when you were deciding uh, how to make your uh, information about you available online, anything like that. So. It's hard to anticipate what your needs are in future. The best thing to do is try to make choices that limit the negative impact that you can receive later. Um, it's possible to upgrade safety to change your practices, but if you're looking at the lowest level of attacks on journalists, which is non-government sponsored, it's mostly pissing off Nazis, that sort of thing, um, those attacks are unpredictable, and they're mediated by discovering personal information about you. And concealing your personal information from uh, people who might want to hurt you on the internet is a lot of work. Um, and it takes a long way back to effectively protect it. Uh, so I'm not going to say that that's what you need to do, but um, that's the only way that you can effectively protect yourself from someone trying to order a million pizzas to your home or telling the local SWAT team that there is a hostage situation which has never killed anyone yet, but it's only a matter of time. Hopefully that was too much in answer to your question. Yes? So given that one of the most valuable things journalists possess are their sources, I'm curious what advice you give them, especially when if they're using consumer technology like this, they're by design as leaky as possible. You know, so I might have some very valuable contact information in my address book, but then I download some app that ends up leaking it in a way that, you know, let's say a hostile government is able to get that information from the company. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what you generally say to journalists, especially those who are relying on consumer technology, they're not buying you know, secure phones, for example, so how do they manage that problem? Um, the, the easiest technique for this, and when I say easiest, that doesn't mean it's actually easy, uh, it just means that it's easy compared to the alternatives, is to have more than one phone. Uh, you have a phone for work and you have your personal phone. Then you're never going to be installing the um, 
Angry Birds or whatever that's going to upload your contacts list to wherever, whatever, on your work phone. You have separate accounts for your work, for personal. That's also important for your safety uh, because your sources are very important, but your sources can also be assholes. Uh, and having all of the contact info that you put out, you, you, you want sources. Sources are good, they tell you things. You want that contact info to be as widely available as possible. But you don't want a source to start calling you at 3 a.m. Uh, so having a work phone that you can turn off goes a long way. You can, um, you can select better apps to m more effectively protect your source communication if you use Signal. Um, you don't need to have contacts in your contacts. Um, and using Signal is so common that it's unlikely to create a reliable metadata trail to anyone apart from the NSA. And if you're worried about the NSA, th there's no advice in this room that's really helpful. Um, so that's, that's a pretty good situation. Uh, but the, the real answer is it depends, because depending on how you interact with your sources, how many sources you have, what sort of things sources are sending you, how frequently, and so forth, the set of tools that are most appropriate for you vary. So I guess the best answer to that question is find yourself a nerd, a paranoid nerd, but not so paranoid that they can't imagine what the real world is like and constantly pepper them with questions about what to do next, but ignore them when they start going off on PGP or you know anything that's really impractical. Try to bring them down to earth and make them more helpful like that. And as a trade, they'll raise your security game a little bit and let you know about the latest, most exciting hack that definitely doesn't affect you. Yes? You define journalism very broadly in, in, in today's terms. Uh, if someone comes to you and asks for help, how do you uh, categorize them as a journalist? In other words, this might be someone who posts something to a large, largely distributed Twitter account, for example. Mm -hmm. who, who do you help and don't you help? We, we help based on the definition that I've outlined here. Anyone who uh, collects, organizes, and disseminates timely information um, that's the practice of journalism. So there are a lot of people who practice journalism, uh, but not all the time. So if someone comes for help, they say, listen, I practice journalism, and also um, while I was driving to my construction job, I, um, I crashed and I need help paying those medical bills. We'll say, I'm sorry, that sucks. It sucks to be you, but um, that those injuries weren't sustained in any way in relation to the practice of journalism. We, we constrain ourselves to uh, assistance related to the journalism they practice. And that can be very difficult in a lot of cases um, because people who practice journalism, especially in repressive regimes, are often activists also. Uh, even the act of practicing journalism is an activist act if journalism is suppressed where you live. So people practice activism and journalism together. Uh, their organizations, their journalist organizations are both activist and journalist. It becomes very difficult, but uh, we're really good at research, so we try to work it out. You have a follow-up? I have another question. If, let's just technical thing. Let's say someone twice an email account on Google sends a message to another email account on Google. Mm -hmm. The whole system is encrypted along the way. Is, is that really the same thing to do? Uh, if you send an email from a Gmail account to another Gmail account or a Google Apps account to another Google Apps account, uh, your, the contents of your communication never leaves a Google computer. There's no outside opportunity for surveillance of that communication. So. The only question you should ask yourself is whether you think that Google is technically and practically competent to protect the contents of your communication and whether you uh, are willing to rely on them to uphold their responsibility to you. And the same is true of any other service provider. I think in Google's case, the answer to both those questions is yes. Google has the most expensive security team pretty much in the world, so they're probably competent to do that. Um, they also have a really expensive legal team, and they've been seen to fight a lot of legal cases um, to protect the confidentiality of their users. So um, I have pretty good confidence in them. But yes, the only party who has any t sort of practical uh, control over those messages is Google. And the same is true for any other mail provider. If you send a message from that mail provider to that mail provider, um, unless they've done something inadvisable, that message shouldn't go anywhere else. Yeah, interested in your thoughts on the role of government, because in the 
sort of utopian and, and uh, policy debates that you described in the talk. Um, government is very prominent as, as an antagonist when thinking about security services and that sort of thing. So um, but one could also argue that um, the market provision of privacy as is, is a, is a personal or public good has also been lacking. And so how do you think about um, either a constructive role for governments in places where journalism is constitutionally protected or um, in a, a more utopian, optimistic view, how do you see the government playing a constructive role bracketing potential intelligence agencies in these things? Well, I would like to see government rein in intelligence agencies um, and law enforcement, law enforcement, both of which seem to see their role very broadly and try to engage in impossible activities at the expense of actual public safety. Uh, so I guess the, the first most important responsible role for government is doing less bad government. Um, uh, but there is certainly a lot of positive good that government can achieve. Most of it not directly related to journalism, but with positive impacts for journalism. Uh, you raise the notion of privacy as a positive right. That's something uh, that can be very effectively bolstered by government. Um, the US government is not very good at it, doesn't really seem to understand what that means or how to do it. Uh, I don't really have any hope that the current US government is going to enact any positive regulation of any kind. But the European governments really get privacy and a lot of other positive rights of that kind and are in the business of passing positive regulation that protects the rights upon which journalists rely. Not journalist specific rights, but the sort of general free association privacy, freedom of information and communication rights that journalists rely on. So, Building a more positive society in that sense, providing uh, regulation against, I suppose, misbehavior by corporations uh, is, is a very positive role. Another one is to ensure that where, uh, where markets are not an efficient allocator of resources, they don't exist, because that tends to be the mechanism by which we see the bottlenecks that make journalism very difficult. For instance, in information and uh, communication in general, the allocation of spectrum and the uh, allocation of licenses for telecommunications operators, the regulation by which ISPs must compete with each other or are not required to compete with each other, these are ultimately freedom of information and communication issues acknowledging where markets are ineffective and where uh, additional regulation is required to ensure competition where it can exist is a positive role for government and I would like to see that more. In addition uh, to providing infrastructure which is another traditional role of government. Uh, there's a lot of good that government can do. Uh, I generally in this talk for instance don't mention the great work that government tends to do across the world maintaining roads and railway lines, but um, that isn't th that isn't the the problem. So I'm focusing on the downsides. Uh, I acknowledge government does many good things, but in the journalist specific realm of journalists and journalism, there's not a lot of good that government can do except by building a better society all over. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for coming and speaking to us and answering our questions. Um, you said a second ago, basically, like if you're under attack from the NSA, God help you. Um, but do you have any practical advice for someone, a journalist, that is under targeted, directed attack at them from a sophisticated actor like the NSA? No, I don't. Definitely not in three minutes, and uh, more generally, not at all. Uh, and here's why. If the NSA is after you, you specifically, the NSA is not the only one after you. You are under the focused attention of one of the most sophisticated organizations in the world, the United States government. You try and do a bunch of technical malarkey so that they can't surveil your, your stuff. Well, maybe someone breaks into your house at night and messes with your laptop and it doesn't matter what you did. or 
maybe you have a lot of time next time you have a, cross, a border crossing and uh, the threat of your freedom or um, your possession of your physical devices or anything else like that is out of your control. The problem is that there isn't a lot that you as an individual can do when you are going up against the most sophisticated military and espionage uh, institutions that have ever existed in the history of humanity. And anything that I suggest, uh, especially anything that I suggest over the course of three minutes, will simply move danger around between different areas. And most of the time, if I suggest computer safety uh, precautions, uh, you take those computer safety precautions, you've just taken a computer safety problem and made it a physical safety problem, and that's a harder one, and it's more likely to go badly for you. So I do not have good actionable advice for people under the focus of uh, that sort of a problem. Uh, and that would be a, a different presentation, much longer, and uh, a lot more work for everyone in that situation. Uh, any final questions? Well, then, on that very bright note. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming and speaking. And um, yeah, on behalf of CLTC, uh, thank you. Thank you very much.